Hello from the Jerome L. Green Performance Space at the studios of WQXR and New York Public Radio. I'm Jeff Spurgeon, and I'm here to welcome you to Vixen on Varick. It's a preview of the New York Philharmonic's production of the opera by Leos Janacek, The Cunning Little Vixen. The Philharmonic will close its 2010-2011 season with its production of Vixen, staged at Avery Fisher Hall, June 22nd through the 25th. Today we're going to tell you about the opera and its creator. We're going to tell you the story behind the opera and the story of the opera itself, and about the production at the Philharmonic. We'll hear music from the opera performed by members of the cast, including soprano Marie Lamormand, uh, forgive me, Marie Lenormand, baritone Alan Opie, and baritone Joshua Bloom. Pianist Dan Saunders of the Philharmonic is here as well to help. Let's begin, though, with members of the creative team. Would you please welcome New York Philharmonic music director Alan Gilbert, production director and costume designer Doug Fitch, and choreographer Carol Armitage. Well, all right. Welcome to all of you. The story of this opera, of its, its beginnings are actually in some line drawings. So the, the music came much later, or rather, yes, much later than, the, than the, uh, the drawings itself. It was a serial cartoon in a Czech newspaper, published, that's still published today, actually, this uh, newspaper, uh, Lido de Novini. Started out in Brno, and now it's published in Prague. And there was a, an illustrator, a painter, named Stanislav Lolek, who drew some sweet little drawings about a fox and a gamekeeper. And those drawings were the inspiration for the writer, whose name was Rudolf Tieschnothidek. And he was a well-known writer in uh, Czech circles in the 19-teens and the 1920s. And the thing was published in this newspaper in Brno. And I think that we have a picture of the, of the paper. Do we have it? we bring that slide up? That's the title page from the novel that was eventually published, the little novella. So you see the gamekeeper there and the vixen. And the vixen looks a little upset. <laughs> it's just a little simple line drawing. That's the title page. Now we also have a picture of the newspaper itself. Um, these, these pages have not been released. To the, you can't go in and look at them. You can just see these scans. And the story of the cunning little vixen is down on the left-hand corner there. And we can make that a little bigger, I think. And this thing appeared as a serial over a period of a few months in uh, 1920. And there were little things in the newspaper every day in these sweet little line drawings. And the one on the right is probably clear. You can see the vixen and all of her cubs there. And those are the, those are the origins of the opera that the Philharmonic will be producing in a week or so. This story, the newspaper serial, was a favorite of Leos Janacek's long-serving maid. And she, in a book that she later wrote about her work with Janacek, said that she, she was the one who got him to write the opera. <laughs> <clears throat> um, she said that, that he took great pleasure from the premiere of the opera, too, when it came out, and, and would come back delighted watching the singers rehearsing on all fours to play their roles of the animals. <laughs> Alan Gilbert, when did you first hear The Cunning Little Vixen? I don't remember the first performance. I, I, I have known the opera for a long time. I... I saw it, it must have been 25 years ago. And um, I think what struck me at first was the music itself. It's just so incredibly beautiful and, and human and uh, ambiguous in the way that I think life is. And it, it, really, it, really, it really grabbed me. And more recently, uh, it's the first time I'm conducting the opera, but more recently, as I've gotten to know, know it better, I've been fascinated by the Story. It's actually kind of a non-story, and, and it's, it's uh, I think, telling that, as you point out, it, it came from a, a kind of serial, uh, either daily or weekly, I don't know how often these, these, these things appeared, but the opera itself is more a set of vignettes, uh, of kind of scenes that, when taken together, create a picture of a life, this vixen, this, this fox, uh, but, but even more generally of life. Doug Fitch, did you know about The Cutting Little Vixen before Alan Gilbert brought it to you? Uh, yeah, I... I uh, Pull I, that I, microphone a little closer to you, would you? Oh, hello. There you yeah. go. But don't cover up your shirt. Oh, yeah. Yeah. His shirt says Fitch on it. <laughs> I thought it said Abercrombie. <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> 
<laughs> yes, the other one. Uh, no, I, I, had, I had seen it once in uh, Berlin a long, long time ago uh, in a production that I really I just didn't like it. Um, it was the first thing I remember. I didn't like the first production I saw either, yeah. actually. It was, it was it was a big. I thought I'd. Yeah, no, it just it was a, 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 No, I just can't remember. There was something about it that was. I thought it felt like it was supposed to be a children's uh, thing, and it just didn't feel like it fit into that category. And they were trying like big mushrooms and gnomes and things. I guess it was felt like that sort of thing. But I uh, then I then I listened to it, and then then Alan said, "You've got to listen to this carefully because it's really just such a beautiful, beautiful piece of music and so evocative." And and uh, the, when when. When he told me to listen to it again, I, I, I sat down and really listened to it without any other uh, preconceptions of, of it. And it is just this, this extraordinary uh, world that's created. Uh, acoustic, evocative, foresty thing that, uh, that takes you to a place that really is somewhere between uh, our animal nature and the, the, the human anthropomorphizing that we, we do when we look at animals. We'll talk more about that, and for those of you watching the video cast at WQXR.org, you'll get to see some of the costumes that Doug has created that the performers will wear in this program. So um, this production, Alan and, and Doug, is uh, being put together by you guys, the same team who brought Le Grand Macabre to the stage of Avery Fisher Hall last year in a production that was a big box office success and a big critical success. Uh, how long after you were into Macabre, Alan, did you say, hmm, next year, I think Vixen? Oh, actually, the idea of doing Vixen came long before yeah. Macabre actually went up. Yeah. Uh, we had talked about the two kind of uh, together, and, um, you know, things are planned long in advance, far, far ahead of when they actually happen. Um, but these were two operas that I, I thought would work both really well for the New York Philharmonic to do uh, in a kind of special new way of presenting opera, but also would work really well, well for Doug. They're both highly symbolic and representational. And, and, and as Doug just mentioned, the Janacek, the Vixen, is, um, is multi-layered. It has children. It has costumes. It has, has animals. And, and you could see it as a kids' opera, it's, it's really anything but that. I think kids c could enjoy it, but, but, but um, it's, really, it's really about, <clears throat> about people. And I think the fact that they're animals, I think the, the way the message comes across is, is, is powerful because they're animals and children, because there's something very natural about what, how the characters behave. It's, re it's very realistic, and there's something elemental and uh, inevitable about the way the characters work. And uh, I, I guess if, if I can, I don't want to pi oh, pigeonhole. No, no, it's just that <laughs> Doug, I think one of the things that Doug is, is great at, and there are many, is, is to take um, playful objects and, and symbolic things and really connect them to, to, to the real human experience and uh, symbolism and multi-layered um, uh, structures are, I think, what, kind of what Doug is about. So that, that made me think that it could work well. And we can talk about more of the ways that Doug draws those connections to when we look at the costumes a little more closely. Choreographer um, Carol Amitage, um, where do you fit in in all of this? Where did, when did you come into the, to the vixen world? <laughs> I'm a, I'm a new member of the team and delighted to be here. Uh, I, I knew Janacek from studying opera, which I became a huge fan of because I lived in Florence for many years and sort of discovered opera and went to the Salzburg Festival year after year and saw a lot of Janacek there. Though I'd never seen The Cunning Little Vixen, so I'm discovering it from the inside now. And, you know, it is just so marvelous, so, so bittersweet, so full of longing and you know it's it's the kind of the perfect to use another florentine metaphor nel mezzo del cammino you know that you're in the middle of the road of life and and reflecting on what you might still be able to do what missed opportunities occur it just has this extraordinary humanity and um you know we can't live every life there's so much that remains unrequited and yet there's this kind of soulful uplifting side because the the marvels of nature are there to comfort us so it gives you kind of so much soulless in the, in spite of the very dark material 
I want to hear more about, um, about what you've created for the performers to do on the stage of Avery Fisher Hall, and we'll talk about the design of the stage as well, which is quite unusual for this production. But let's hear a little bit of music from The Cunning Little Vixen now. So we'd like to introduce yeah. you to um, the woman who will sing the trouser role in this <laughs> opera. The for, haunches role. <laughs> <laughs> for she sings the role not of a vixen, not of a she-fox, but of a, of a, of a male fox. Um, Alan, and perhaps you can tell us before Marie comes out what she's going to sing about. This is, this is one of the most charming moments in the opera. Uh, the vixen meets this fox and um, the interaction is, 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 is very realistic and, and awkward in the way that, that anyone who's meeting someone whom one is interested in um, knows. Uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit like a, a blind date and they're kind of interrupting each other and trying too hard to be just perfect. And, and, and I think what, what Marie is going to sing now is, is um, the point um, after which they've sort of admitted to each other that they like each other and just why he is um, so in love with the vixen. All right, so let's introduce the fox in The Cunning Little Vixen to perform live at the Jerome L. Green Performance Space on this live broadcast and, uh, and video webcast at uh, 105.9 FM and wqxr.org. Here is mezzo-soprano Marie Lenormand. Please welcome her. Soprano, Metro Soprano, Marie Lenormand, in the role of the fox in The Cunning Little Vixen. Uh, uh, bring the mic to, uh, to uh, Marie. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mezzo sopranos are accustomed to playing what in opera are called trouser roles, where you sing the role of a, of a man. Yes. Is this the first time that you've sung the, a trouser role in a character that doesn't actually wear any trousers? <laughs> no. Actually, it's not the first time. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, I sang another fox in a, an opera called The Little Prince. I also sang a dog. Actually, the dog in Little Vixen is also a male who is madly in love and heartbroken his entire life. And I, I played the dog, and I was just as a dog, a male dog. So this is just another day at work for you, isn't Exactly. It? <laughs> have you seen the costume that Doug has, that Doug has designed? Yes, I had a costume feeling a few, it does few have, ago. It does have pants, I think. Yes, I do. I do have pants. Okay, that's somehow reassuring, I think, for, <laughs> for is it? all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Were you worried? <laughs> well, Doug no. can be very creative, so you have to be, you have to be careful. Okay. Um, tell me about this character. He's, he comes across as a sort of a, um, uh, a young man just coming into his own? Exactly. 
he's like a, a teenager or a young man arriving and he's hunting a lot and he stumbles upon this beautiful vixen in the clearing and he the, the whole scene between the vixen and the fox is really a beautiful love duet and besides a few things in, that they're saying, for example, in, to try to seduce her, I say, well, do you like rabbits? And I go hunt one so she falls in love with me, but the rest of it is really a very human love story with the heart pangs of young love and very nervous, awkward kids who don't know how to handle themselves in front of someone they're really attracted to. Are you spending time on all fours? Uh, we'll talk to Carol more about this too, but <laughs> well, are you actually down? Uh, no, not so much, but we haven't finished staging the okay. show. So maybe you can add that, Carol. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Thank you, Marie. It was Thank lovely you. to hear you. Thank, Thank you. you. Marie Lenormand. <laughs> you know... This is Vixen on Varick, a preview of the New York Philharmonic's production of Jana Czech's The Cunning Little Vixen, which will be staged in Avery Fisher Hall June 22nd through the 25th. And we're very pleased today to have with us the creative team for the opera, uh, New York Philharmonic music director Alan Gilbert, and uh, production designer and costume designer Doug Fitch, and the director and the choreographer, um, Carol Armitage. Ms. Armitage, you have children to work with in this in this production, and a lot of them, and they, they are insects and bugs, and they run around a lot. What do you... And rodents. And rodents. <laughs> how, how are you working with them, and, and how are you finding it working with them? Well, it is pretty wild. You walk in there, and, you know, they're, they're kids running around like mad, doing unpredictable things, hard to contain their wild, youthful energy, and then all of a sudden they have to sing, and they're like these perfectly disciplined little angels. I mean, it's astounding. But they're incredibly fun because they, you know, they're just ready to try anything. I mean, there's sort of no limits in a way. And you have to be very precise and clear and give them very, you know, concrete instructions. And then they, they capture it incredibly quickly and they're, you know, very adaptable. And each one is a distinct personality. So it's also using that, which is really fun. Doug, you're thinking of some things here, I think. Well, I'm just thinking one of the things that you, you notice is that when you hear them sing and when you watch these, these kids, that's the kids from the Metropolitan Opera Choir, they're really smart, wonderful children. And uh, they're all very serious and very earnest about what they're doing, but they're just also just so fun. So you kind of think when they start singing this stuff, you hear that how, how well uh, Janacek kind of captures the adult in every child and sort of mm -hmm. as much as he captures the ch child in every adult and the kind of it's really that, that both of those at the same time. Um, I, I was just going to say before, because there's also the adolescent in between, which is where the, well, maybe a little post-adolescent, but the fox and the vixen, when, the, when Marie's character comes out of the forest and he's trying to interest this beautiful vixen, he doesn't know quite how to, to speak to such an independent woman, and he <laughs> says, uh, do you smoke? <laughs> <laughs> which is the other side of saying, do you like rabbits? <laughs> you know? <laughs> And she says, uh, no, not yet, because she's trying to be cool. <laughs> the sensibility of the times, sure, right. in the 19-teens. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a feminist cool aspect of it. Yeah. I, I, like it. I like it when, when, when the fox says, it's not your body. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> I love that too. <laughs> yeah, right, that they've mistake. known each other for <laughs> five <laughs> minutes. No, I mean, it is. I mean, it is your body. I mean, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's a, it's a very sweet thing. Um, uh, Carol, there isn't any uh, ballet per se in the Cunning Little Vixen, is there? Are, well, you choreo are you choreographing things other than movement? Is there dance? There is one dancer who makes an appearance as the dream of the forester, as his true love interest. Who, um, the, voc the vixen basically turns into this woman in his mind. So there is one dancer like um, who is a trained dancer. The rest are, are the children, and of course, the singers that I'm working with for movement. And that's, she's a dancer from your company? From my company, yes. You're the, the what is it, the punk ballerina? The punk I see, Yeah, I, I, you that, know. The it's designation <laughs> that, you've, that you've been given by the popular world? Yes, I mean, I like it because it's full of contradiction. You know, the rawness of punk and the refinement of ballet. And that's one of the things I love about this opera. It's full of these extreme contradictions. Um, Doug, we have a little video for those of you who are able to watch the video webcast and for those here in the Jerome L. Green performance space and those of you watching at wqxr.org. We have a little video of the costumes. For the radio audience, we're going to have to do a little old-fashioned descriptive work. So um, we'll... <laughs> you want me to dub it? <laughs> <laughs> sort of. So, but we, uh, uh, we 
got the gracious permission of the New York Philharmonic to use some of the video that they shot at Doug's studios so that you can all get a flavor of the whimsy and delight that goes into the costume creation for the cunning little vixen. So let's see that video and, and we'll talk about it, Doug, as we go along, all right? Okay, very good. So those pictures, those buttons on the wall, those are... Yeah, yeah well, that's a, those are, that's a big, huge painting on the outside of my studio. All right, just that's, as you walk in. That's, uh, that's the studio. And those are dragonfly wings that were made out of uh, that uh, sort of uh, safety orange fencing, plastic fencing we ripped off of a place, uh, on a decrepit uh, construction site near my place there. That's a bunch of stuff. As you can see, we're using... For, uh, scuba flippers and, uh, well, there's artificial aloe vera. Those will be the hands of the beetle getting glued on. Looks like not quite... Martha Stewart would be proud of you for your use of <laughs> craft glue in yes, the construction yes, we have of these costumes. Yes, yes, all sorts of glues, including hot glue. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and there's a dragonfly's tail made out of uh, spray-painted uh, Gatorade bottles and mayonnaise things. Are the people who work for you, are these, these look young, young people, are they students, yeah. costume students? Are they... No, they're, the it's people? a bunch of people. There's uh, students who just... Those are, well, there's the hands of the, the uh, shall we call him the rooster, grabbing his, uh, ah. the breasts of his chicken. Uh, uh, you know, uh, chicken breasts. Um, <clears throat> we call them chicken bosoms, just to be polite around my studio. So. A terrific uh, idea for the frogs. <laughs> Feet, actual swimming flippers. Yeah, it was easier. <laughs> <laughs> this is the hedgehog and uh, his, his eight-year-old Dylan on the floor. He just got into this thing and we couldn't stop him. He was <laughs> unstoppable. Yeah, he was great. So we made all of his uh, uh, quills out of, uh, um, I think it was duct tape and foam rubber. <laughs> the, it's, um, These there are the he is again cubs. as a fox uh, cub. And they have fabulous <laughs> tails. Yeah, the, the tails are just beautiful. Yeah, thanks. And, and so yeah, a lot it's of work. Yeah. Have you done a lot of work, Doug, with children on stage? Uh, I, I suppose I have done a fair amount of work with children on stage. Um, I did uh, the Hansel and Gretel uh, with Alan and the Los Angeles uh, Opera a while ago, and and uh, they didn't hire a choreographer that time, so I had to do that, <laughs> jumping around. And that's where I learned a lot about, okay, break it down, break it down, make it simple. And, it, and when you do, and when you make it clear, it's a great lesson in making things clear. Because suddenly it looks good. <laughs> we should grab a couple of the props, too, that you oh, have here, just to, just to uh, bring them up and show you your like? brilliant recycling skills. <laughs> grab, grab the green helmet. The, the green, green helmet. All righty. Um, this is uh, the helmet of a bug and the eyes of a bug, I think. <laughs> well, it's a bike helmet, really. But spray painted green and yellow, a little well, airbrushing. Spray painted. It's hand carefully hand painted <laughs> bike helmet. Yes, it has uh, papaya. Uh, ab, ab, God, it sounds like the Rose Bowl parade when I'm talking. <laughs> Actual fresh papayas on the. <laughs> <laughs> they're giant. Yeah, they're giant artificial papayas on top to make the bug size. It's we, just we a beautiful. We only use helmet. actually uh, not real materials. These are <laughs> artificial. Cattails for the antenna, and so that's a that's the grasshopper. And and you have a beetle um, yeah. helmet there. Yeah, this is a beetle. It's a beautiful purple color with a pair of old-fashioned radio headphones. Ah, that's what they are on yeah. the side to form the eyes. This is a, this is a safety helmet. It's a hard hat with the. Uh, uh, um, I guess they're, they're constru well. They're construction mufflers. Is that's what they right. Are. So you that you won't site. destroy your ears. Right. <laughs> but look, which at is the, not um, the greatest thing to put on, uh, you know, person in the opera. But that's okay. <laughs> different. <laughs> he's, he's not singing at that time. Right. Um, and, and the back is what the, I love. It took me a few sorry. minutes to recognize what that's made of. This is a purple. It's the back of a beetle. Does anyone, does anyone in the audience recognize what that is? <laughs> garbage can. Cut. It's a garbage can lid. Cut. And that guy works in my studio. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Just beautiful. And let's grab that uh, that uh, spongy white coiled up thing. That's my favorite prop. <laughs> There's nothing recycled about this. We just took. Uh, hmm. It's. Uh, what is it? Well, it's an, it's an accordion. You see. It's an accordion. Well, it's a grub or and a larva. <laughs> the butterfly plays, kind of, her, you know, her larva. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so there's great, it, they're just beautiful, and there's such great whimsy in all of the design for this. Um, did you, you begin sketching? How far ahead do you plan these costumes? Do you start sketching them as soon as, as, soon as Alan said, Vixen, what do you think? And you went, uh, <laughs> no, on a piece of paper? Because that was actually years ago when we <laughs> talked about it, and I didn't know where to start. Um, but when I knew the context that we were going to be working in, which was once again in the concert hall, uh, New York Philharmonic, um, that informs a lot of things very quickly. Uh, there's no fly space, there's no backstage space to speak of. Um, you do have the great advantage of having the entire orchestra on set on stage in there. And that presence of, of uh, live sound being produced uh, visually as well as sonically. And, uh, but there's also no orchestra pit, there's no trap doors, there's none of that at all. So. Um, there are some really specific problems, but those create that may, those make you think in a different different way altogether. I started making the drawings and uh, 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 last summer, I think it was. I was inspired I, by huh? Yeah. No, I just want to uh, to say that I think the context that you're talking about also includes the ma grand macabre that happened last yes. year, which was such a specific aesthetic. It was. It, it was very high tech. There was video, and there was a simultaneous yeah. projection, and there were very, very elaborate cameras and things. And and I think part of the context, if I'm not mistaken, for you was the idea of of, of doing something very, very different. And this couldn't be more different. There's there's nothing exactly. high tech about From it at the all. Yeah, yeah, it's just it's That's just it's, it's sure. you know good old fashioned creativity and crafts and and mm -hmm. and it's you know traditional. I, I, there's theater. also a quality of when we're doing something when you see the. I mean. In grand opera, it's all about kind of fooling everybody into thinking mm -hmm. this is a completely different world. They, you can't see where the music's being made, and it's right there and down. And you, you're not supposed to see the cables that lower down the, you know, the cupids and things like that. Um, but in this case, it's just like the, you don't have any chance to, to do that. And, and so it draws, I think it's all about uh, playing the cards, uh, showing your cards from the very beginning and saying, we're, we're making kind of stupid magic. It's like, this, anybody can do this. It's sort of about doing it yourself on some, pla on some plane that makes it a lot of fun. But one of the You're changes watching the, the entire process unfold, the process of the music making itself, and therefore that's what I think is interesting about this kind of approach visually. One but, of the things you've done this year, as I understand it, is that, is that the stage is being extended over some of the seats? Yeah. Um, in Avery Fisher Hall, <laughs> <clears throat> and that's to give you a little more space to perform. Uh, well, what else? The performers, yeah. The performers. <laughs> yeah, um, and also because the just to draw the the story into the hall itself. I mean, there's this feeling of this large empty space, which is very different from a traditional kind of proscenium, which which is a window th into another world. So I love the idea of bringing the, the, the singers right out, in, the, in, in this case, the children and the dancers, and way out into the row L, as a matter of fact, we can, we can call it. It's a long way. It's a long way. Halfway through the alphabet, yeah. practically. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and when you're out there, you really feel like you're inside this place, which is transformed, you know, and hopefully it's transformed in your own minds a little bit like a forest glen. Or, now, Alan, doesn't that give you a challenge, though, because, because you're conducting up on stage, and usually in an opera, the conductor's in the pit, and everybody on stage is pointed toward the audience, the orchestra's in the pit looking up at the conductor, the performer's on stage looking out, they can see you. But if you have performers behind you... <laughs> it's, a, it's a huge challenge, um, uh, and completely not the way opera is usually done, with the orchestra, obviously, closer to the audience, in between the conductor and the, and the stage. But um, I think one thing that a lot of people may not realize is a lot of the contact that the that the singers have with the with the conductor even in a traditional opera house is these days um, via video monitors that are strategically placed where mostly where the audience can't see them in the wings and above sometimes above the audience behind um, so that when the singer is singing out to the house um, they are actually seeing a projected image of the conductor um, and we did it last year and the Ligeti obviously is an extremely complicated piece, and, and the coordination with the orchestra worked extremely well. For me, I actually, I, if I may dare say, I think that it's harder for me because I can't really see what they're doing. And one of the things that I really like and that I frankly miss in this particular setup, which is unavoidable and I think totally worth, worth doing, but I, I, I do miss the face-to-face the face 
contact with with the stage, the 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 interaction that's possible to have looking into someone's eyes, and um, that that I miss entirely. But we've worked out a pretty good system. Danny Boyko is my assistant, and he's a he's a terrific musician and a terrific conductor, and he's along for all the rehearsals, and he'll be placed in a kind of prompter's position. In row L. In row L at the end of this little <laughs> jutting piece of stage. And he'll be able to, well, hopefully channel me and... and, uh, and well, he uh, did that last yeah. year, too. Yeah, and it yes, worked, it worked right. extremely well. And, the and this year, of course, all the costumes have rear view mirrors for the singers. <laughs> <laughs> just I, I, right need, I need the rear view mirror. That's <laughs> yeah. what I mean. Well, let's turn to some more music now from the opera on this Vixen on Varick preview of the New York Philharmonic's production of Jana Czech's The Cunning Little Vixen. Um, with us, uh, well now, we're going to hear a duet between the forester and, I don't know the character's name, he's the poacher. Harashta, yeah. Um, Harashta is, is probably the closest to a, a bad character that appears in this, in this opera. I think all the characters are very, they're, they're just people, so they're not really particularly good or bad. They're just just people. And um, Harashta is a poacher, and what he poaches is well, animals, but also is in this case ambiguously presented as the girl that everybody is 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 interested in. And um, he's interacting with the forester, who's kind of the main everyman protagonist character of the opera. And uh, the forester is is. Um, not happy about the fact that Harasha is poaching the animals on the land that he's supposed to be protecting, but probably even more disturbingly, the, uh, the woman that he, he himself secretly is interested in. All right, so please welcome, if you would, to the stage of the Jerome L. Green Performance Space on this live broadcast and videocast at 105.9 FM and WQXR.org, our forester and our poacher in the cunning little vixen, baritones Alan Opie and Joshua Bloom. Yes, 
sits Terinka. Terinka, Terinka, Terinka. I hope you're not poaching a harvester as heavens above me and earth beneath my feet. No, not a shot. And yet, yet I really ought to watch this nonsense. Well, you see that hair lying yonder, quite cold and lifeless. I went to pick it up. But something inside me, something kept on saying. Hands off! I guess I don't do it! You'll be sorry! Hands off, hands off, hands off! Don't do it! You'll be sorry! Quite cold and lifeless. Yes, quite cold and lifeless. So she's still causing trouble. I'll catch her, no doubt she'll be back to collect it. Alan Opie and Joshua Bloom as the forester and as Harashta, the poacher, in Jana Czech's The Cunning Little Vixen. Both these gentlemen remain on stage with us at the, at the Jerome L. Green performance space on this live Vixen on Varick preview. Mr. Bloom, you were part of the company of uh, uh, last year's La Grand Macabre. I, I was, yes. And, and uh, uh, what is the... How, how is... Were you happy at the... Well, of course you were happy at the possibility of working again with these people. <laughs> good I'll question. try to answer the question. I'm on, I'm on air, aren't I? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll try to ask you a less obvious yeah. question. Uh, no, no, absolutely. I mean, I was... Uh, both of these productions I specifically asked to be on. It wasn't that the New York Phil sought me out. I, I, as, as soon as I uh, uh, realised through, through uh, my cunning... Uh, you know, in, in for, in for, in for informants that uh, that these productions were going on. I, I got onto my manager straight away and said, "I really want to be a part of this." What's the admir uh, what's the attraction for this for these roles? Uh, well, uh, initially, the the, the Ligeti uh, it's a piece that's at least in this country is not done very often, um, and it's a fantastic piece, and, and and I really wanted the opportunity to work with Alan, and I hadn't I didn't know anything about Doug, and having worked with both of them. Uh, it's an absolute joy. I mean, not only are they two incredibly clever people that, you know, I mean, which is quite obvious, but the rehearsal process is incredibly fun. And I think all the performers 
have an enormous, get an enormous amount of enjoyment out of, out of uh, doing the pieces, and I think that translates to the audience as well. Have you done this opera before? Have you done I have before? not. I covered the badger in San Francisco. <laughs> what is that? That's not a euphemism. That's not a euphemism. It sounds like code, but it's not. In fact, there is a badger in the cunning little vixen, and cover is what opera singers do who stand Un by. Under, and, understudy, yeah. yeah. Um, but but, but not, not this role, no. <laughs> um, uh, the reason I asked, and perhaps Mr. Opie, you can answer this too, D have you learned this opera in its original Czech? I have, yes. Um, yeah. And how is it to translate then, to go, do you have to alter the music because the, the idiom, the language idioms don't match, English and Czech don't match? Not at all, they, they don't match. Uh, I, yes, a lot of the rhythms do get changed, but that's changed by the people that basically do the edition. So is there, are there differences the, in the music then? Uh, not that you wouldn't. I mean, if you knew the Czech specifically and and um, then heard the English translation, you would say, well, those those notes are slightly different in um, in rhythm, but not in pitch. The reason I ask is I wonder. It's hard enough to learn a foreign language and an opera role, but then to go back to music that you know but have it changed a little bit seems really difficult. I, well, I learned it in English first. I first did it in English. Um, so the difficult thing was then doing it in Czech. <laughs> uh, and I learned it in a different English translation because we were sent a different English translation to start off with and then they replaced it. <laughs> well, I guess we can just say it's a miracle that both of you are here today. <laughs> <laughs> it's a miracle that we got some of the words right, yeah. <laughs> um, it's a miracle I got up on the stage, actually. <laughs> Mr. Ope, I love, I love the character of the forester. He's a little bit of a philosopher and sees the world over a long view. And a little bit, I, I think of Hans Sachs. I think of Hans Sachs in oh, Meistersinger. That's interesting. Um, I think that only comes towards the end of the, the piece. I think he suddenly becomes poetic at the end. Up until then, he's very sort of everyday and, and, and in fact, to a certain extent, bored with his life. It, he's, uh, everything has just been the same over throughout the years. And it's... This experience with the vixen, which has made him a, f a bit of a fool, really, that really upsets him. And then uh, the, the last scene comes along, which you'll hear in a minute, uh, where he becomes very poetic and, and realizes on the regeneration of life and, and how it's, the world is, in fact, a fantastic place. We'll hear from you again in okay. a minute, Mr. Opie. Thank you. Alan Opie and Joshua Bloom. And Dan Saunders at the piano as well from the Philharmonic. Thank you, Dan. Now, as to the lead character herself, the vixen, um, she can't be here with us today, but I had a chance last week to speak with Isabel Bayrock Darian. Um, she puts on a costume to play the vixen in this production of Jana Cech's opera, but she told me that she already knows this character from her own personal experience. Ladies, in each one of us, ladies, and I'm speaking about an animal here. We see her as a young, chatty, gossipy little, you know, 11-year-old or a 12-year-old girl almost. And then we see her as this feisty teenager with um, new ideas about women's uh, equality, the freedom to express your opinion, even though you will be punished for it. And then she develops into a young woman who is in love for the first time. And then we also see her as a mother of eight children and still in love and still planning on having more kids. Surprisingly, perhaps, coming from an opera singer, Isabel Bayrock Darian likes being on all fours as the vixen. I have sung this role a couple of times. I'm amazed every single time of how liberating it is to sing as close to terra firma as possible. You gain strength from it. It liberates you, really, when your center of gravity is as close to, to Earth as possible. It's, it's, you become an instinctive being and not so much uh, of a thinking being. We asked her to describe Janacek's music in the opera. It alternates between the pitter-patter of, you know, the scurrying of animals. And then all of a sudden, imagine what the forest would sound when looked from above. And when it's the view from above, it's this grand, majestic, lush sound that just so romantic. Ah, oh, 
it just melts your heart. Isabel Bayrak Darian is a native of Armenia. Her family moved to Canada when she was younger, but she did not always want to be an opera singer. In fact, she finished college headed in an entirely different direction. I became a biomedical engineer. I graduated and I was taking a singing lesson on the side just so I could sing better in church. I hadn't really seen an opera until I was 17 and that's late and really singing was a hobby and it started for the sheer love of it. And it took over my life after a very short time. I just loved, loved, loved. It actually brought out the real me. I uh, wouldn't imagine my life any other way. Being on stage, once you've done it, you have to have it again and again so that you can be better and better and better. You've heard her describe the vixen as a strong, independent female character. But Isabel Bayrock Darian says the vixen has something to teach us all. Nothing could break her spirit because she's wild at heart. And that's the charm of anybody. If you try to change someone, even though you mean well, be sure that you don't change them to look like you. It's such a good lesson for us. And there's one more reason she loves playing the vixen. The pride, of course, of my costume is my big tail. <laughs> I love saying that. How many times can I say that about my other roles? <laughs> she is completely charming, Isabel Byrock Darian. So we had a chance to share that chat with you that we had the other day. Let's talk about, um, well, just real quickly, the synopsis of the opera is that uh, this forester is wandering through the forest one day and he gets a chance to grab a hold of this young she-fox, takes her home as a plaything for the children. She proves to be problematic, she remains wild at heart, escapes back in the forest, but she's captured something in, in the forester and in the people she meets. She goes back to the forest, she meets the fox, they have a litter of eight children, and as she said, uh, as Isabel said, they stay in love and they want to have more children. Now, unlike in the original newspaper story, Jana Cech does something that the original author did not do. Um, the vixen is killed by the poacher. And the details of that will, of course, come when you go to see the opera itself. But what, is, what comes out of that is the thing that lingers, I think, with the adult in the audience. And that is um, the last part of the opera, where the forester returns and muses on what happens. Alan, could you set this last aria up a little bit for us that Alan's going to sing for us? Well, uh, well, Alan, the other Alan, already, already, I think, described very well this kind of learning process that the forester undergoes. And when he finally sings at the end, there's a real wisdom that comes from having experienced life and, and a kind of very simple joy at, at realizing what, what life has to offer without there being any special events necessarily, but just the fact of life and being able to live life and uh, the truth of regeneration and the, and, the, and the sort of comfort one can take from knowing that the next generation will carry on and that, that the cycle goes on and on. And it's, um, for me, a, a very, very moving um, way for the opera to end. As I, as I said, it's not, it's not a linear story that's presented in these two hours uh, of, of the music. It's, it's more, more um, pictures um, that sort of when pasted together, create a picture of, uh, a, a total picture of what, what life is about and what maybe even life means. So please, once again, welcome to the stage of the Jerome L. Green Performance Space, baritone Alan Opie, for one more moment of music from The Cunning Little Vixen. <laughs> as a new tin soldier chestnut brown mushroom cap like a girl I knew Just a 
Baritone Alan Opie and pianist Dan Saunders from the New York Philharmonic. Thank you. Just wonderful in the role of the forester in Janáček's The Cunning Little Vixen. Alan Gilbert, have many of the members of the Philharmonic played this music before? I would guess that very, very few of them have played this, and that's one of the reasons that I, I really like to like to bring operatic repertoire. You know, a symphony orchestra plays all potentially all the music that is written for, for orchestra and uh, obviously opera um, provides the possibility of doing great, great master masterpieces that are unfamiliar, which is, I think, 
a priori a really wonderful chance for the musicians. And you clearly have a, a mission to bring some staged opera to the Philharmonic audience. Is that because you love the medium or you're giving the musicians a chance to have a little bit of a, uh, do something a little bit different? Uh, uh, both, both of those, those reasons. Um, I think that, that boundaries between the types of music and the genres are, are often artificial and, and also boundaries between the different art forms. I, I, I love finding connections between theater and visual arts and, and, uh, and, um, and music and you know, this kind of Gesamtkunstwerk idea and I think that's what Doug is all about. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that our audiences are finding the same excitement at, at realizing how it's all really part of the same same big idea. I think Doug's going to get a shirt that says Gesamtkunstwerk on it for the next time that he shows up here. Yeah. The letters I always will be loved small. this idea totally. But you know, it's a Gesamtkunstwerk for me. I was used to ma make up pieces, uh, plays that had music and dance and everything we could cram into them. And I used to call them Gesundheitkunstwerk. <laughs> so, and then I found out later that actually means healthy artwork, which is not bad. So. Locatarian Gesundheit Kunstwerk, yeah, at the New York Fair, please. What did you What did you learn from the last production, Doug, that informed what you did this time? Other than Other than contrasting the style, not using the video technology and the projection technology this time. Well, actually, we will be using some uh, projection technology uh, this time. Um, what did I learn? That was the question. <laughs> I learned an awful lot of things. Um, uh, I don't know if I would. Uh, I, I know that one of the things I learned was this is possible, <laughs> and it, it, that wasn't some completely clear. But you kind of it just jump into things like this and and thinking, well, yeah, there's a cliff. Let's take that one, and uh, this uh, parachute. Uh, no, it was, <laughs> but it was fantastic to do that and have. Um, um, and to have uh, suddenly this, there's this network of people there. Um, I'm working with a guy named Edouard Jeta, who's the producer of uh, our company called Giants Are Small. And that was our first show, really, to do something that we, we had done something before, but it was really our first way of working something out together. And there were so many problems to solve. So uh, I think uh, one of the things that I, I love about, as I said before, a little bit, uh, doing things this way is that you're watching the process of making the thing as, as at the same time that you're watch, watching the thing. Mm. And uh, it, it sort of goes into your head a little bit like a live radio show <laughs> in a sense. Well, we like those here. So <laughs> yes, we, like that. I think so. we like that medium a lot. And Carol Armitage, the music in this opera is, as Isabel Bayrock Darian said, it mm. kind of, it's kind of jumpy. Um, in the spots where the animals and the insects are, are appearing. Does that help you in helping your um, young performers create movement, or do you, do you find yourself having to work against it a little bit to create um, order and a structure that they can follow? I know. The music helps all the time. It's so evocative. It's, it's, the melodies are so infectious, and yet there's these strange kind of harmonic changes and odd rhythms occasionally, so that there's a kind of vertigo to it that's really thrilling. I, no, it's just del pure delight. I love that word. You used that the other day, vertigo. I it, the like, music's full of it, I you're think. You're counting eight, 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 <laughs> nine. Yeah. Nine, ten. Okay, eight, 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 nine. <laughs> and the kids are learning it. And they just do it. <laughs> well, congratulations to the company. And, and by the way, we'll ask all our singers to come out once again for your acknowledgement one more time. Alan Opie and Joshua Bloom and Marie Lenormand, our three performers here, and pianist Dan Saunders from the Philharmonic. On stage. Thanks very much. Thanks very much to the four of you, and, um, and we'll conclude our time together today. The New York Philharmonic's production of Jana Checks the Cunning Little Vixen runs at Avery Fisher Hall, which will become a sunflower-filled forest field, a beautiful place, in Lincoln Center, June 22nd to 25th. WQXR will broadcast live the performance on June uh, 23rd, the Thursday night, at 9 p.m. as part of the New York Philharmonic This Week series. It'll be a nationwide broadcast. You'll be fine. Just calm down. You'll <laughs> be just fine. And a special thank you to our guests today, choreographer Carol Armitage and director and costume designer Doug Fitch and the New York Philharmonic music director, uh, Alan Gilbert. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you.
Thanks once again to our Green Space staff and our WQXR staff. Eileen Delahunty is the executive producer for this broadcast. I'm Jeff Spurgeon. We thank you so much for your attendance, your viewing, and your listening, depending on which respective medium you've employed this afternoon to access this program. And we return you now to David Garland in the studios of Classical 105.9 FM, WQXR. Thank <laughs> you.